Um, uh, this is uh, the Alaska uh, TAPS pipeline. You can see that the <coughs> pipeline peaked uh, right before 1990, and it's been on a steady decline from 2 million barrels a day, and it's on a dead straight, dead line, loser <coughs> trend, uh, trend <coughs> basically going to zero. And so, do you see a glass half empty or a glass half full in that decline? I mean, obviously, the vast majority would say it's glass half empty because it's peaked, it's mature, da da da, da. I look at that and I kind of go, there's a million and a half barrels a day of, uh, of available, available capacity on that pipeline. I mean, you know, if I'm trying to jam oil into an already full pipeline, I have no chance. But if you're talking about, you know, this huge investment that people are trying to, like, uh, get oil into it, I'm sitting there, I'm like, well, okay, I kind of like this. But you better have a good idea to back it up. But I, I, like, I like that availability. So let me show you this. This is where it starts getting really good. In case it's not good up to this point, it's now really going to get good. <laughs> so here's the, here's the area between Kapar Field and Alpine Field. And look at the well control. There's not much, right? I mean, there's like one well or two wells a, per township. Almost none. So I, I look at that and I say, well, there's a real opportunity there. So we came up with this idea right here just to the east of Alpine and about 10 miles, 12 miles west of Kaparik. So um, I'm gonna show you a little cross section that goes out of Alpine and into the till well through these two wells called the Fjord 3 and 3A wells. And uh, so I'm gonna show you these two wells here and I'm gonna show you this line of section. This is geoporn. In case you guys are interested in what Joe Borden is. All right. Can I say that too? Can I say, can I say Geo Porn? You just did. I just did. All right. So here on the left side of this line, on this seismic line here, is a little bit of pay drilled by Arco in 1995. And then 200 feet away is more pay. And this was MDT'd and it was logged, and guys, it's just pay on logs. I mean, it's like one of those things you kind of go, I can't believe that there's pay on logs and they didn't try to perforate it. In fact, we were there, and this is 2013, so this is 18 years after these wells were drilled, and my guys kept bringing this to me, and I kept saying to myself, guys, Conoco's not stupid, Arco's not stupid. They had to have had some data that condemned this. And we kept looking it up and we're like, going, no, they didn't. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't believe that. I bet they had something internally that said it was wet or it was low gravity oil or something. You know, you, you'd have to think that because it's so goddamn obvious that you're like, there's no way these guys missed this, none. So look at the size, you can see this wedge. So this is basically the uh, this hard shale, and you have this huge wedge of sediment, and it's just nothing in it. And it gives you no signature on seismic. And then where the well is drilled, let me go back a little bit, you can see that the river, the river runs right through here, so they had a hard time undershooting the river. And so the data quality just went to shit at this location. And we had a we had a really nice prospect in the Jurassic down below us, and that was our primary objective. So we drilled through this, and the day after we drilled through this right here, and of course we were drilling through that amplitude, and there was nothing in it, and of course everybody likes an amplitude, I mean, because, but I've, I've learned through a lot of dry holes that up on the north slope, a lot of amplitudes don't work. I turned to my geophysicist, I said, hey Kevin, What's going to happen tonight? He said, tonight's big. Tonight's going to be a huge night. And I go, why is that? And he says, because there is absolutely fucking nothing on seismic. Because <laughs> we just drilled through an amplitude, and it didn't work. And so I'm going to say a non-amplitude is good. You know, that's, one of those that's one of those side stories about like, like uh, drilling alpine. 
So, uh, which way does that cross section run? East, uh, west, east. West, east. West, east. So, yeah, going back to the that line there, so it's, it's kind of uh, southwest and northeast. So, there's the red line on there where you see the section. So, uh, there's where the line runs, starting here through Fjord 3 to this well here. So, it's a, essentially a, a west to east cross, uh, cross section. So, till one is to the west. Till one is to the east, and it's uh, out in front, and you can see it here, and there's nothing in it. It's just a whole bunch of shale. Right. Uh, just a big old pile of shale. A little hint of uh, sands in the basal part of the, of the, of the section. So, um, there's, there's the interpretation pre-drill, and we looked at it and we said, okay, there was an up-to-the strat trap of the, of the NAN3, and then it thickened, and the ARCO passed on that in 1995. And then there's some remnants out in front here. And we speculated internally, like, guys, I think there's a whole lot of sand being developed here right on the shelf edge. And so, pre-drill, we had this regional geology and seismic annotated, it indicated that there was this possibility of all this sand. And so we drilled it, and there we had it, 300 feet of pay. We knew immediately that we had found a big field. And here's how I knew that. I've drilled so many wells in my life. You know when something really good happens. I mean, if this was, let's say, 30 feet of sand, you'd say, okay, that's good. Or if it was 30 feet of pay on water, or whatever, but no, we had all this sand, it, it built up to essentially 900 feet, and we saw no water in it the whole way. And so, even if we had drilled a small closure by accident, this is well past the spill point of any, any kind of a small closure. So, um, that's the way it looks blown up. I mean, think about this, guys. We're onshore in the United States of America, 4,200 foot depth, we have up to 300 feet of pay, 250 feet of pay, up to 30% porosity, almost a Darcy permeability, low water saturations, good crude oil, huge hydrocarbon column. We found a 13 billion barrel oil field in place. I mean, just unbelievable. I told everybody in Alaska, guys, we just hit the home run. Conoco Phillips told everybody that I was just a promoter. I was just a small guy. They could never miss something. I was hyping it. I needed to like pump it to get money, blah, blah, blah. But we knew internally it was big. And um, my entire company was absolutely wasted by 10 a.m. that morning. <laughs> because I have a small company. It's only 15 people, 12 people, and uh, we're all in it to win. And so we knew that day. They show up at the office and we had this log to drool over and um, uh, like I said, everybody was taking an Uber home by about three in the afternoon. So uh, really exciting. So um, let me, see, uh, I'm, I'm gonna get maybe too technical for this group. No, and, uh, uh, pardon me if I, if I do because uh, I wanna be cognizant of the time and also I don't wanna bore you guys too much but this is, and now we're, now we're into geophysical Viagra. So we got, um, you can see here, this is the CDP gather of, of uh, the pick field from uh, the deep uh, Jurassic up, uh, up to shallow. And this is the nears on the left, uh, near angles on the left going to 40 degree angle on the right. And you can see that, um, that uh, the Alpine lights up like a big dog on uh, the far offsets with almost no representation in the nears. If you go to the uh, shale uh, uh, source rock, it's bright on the nears but nothing on the far, so therefore you know it's shale and not very good. And then you go to the bottom set fans, again, it's a really nice class uh, two AVO. And then if you go to um, the shallow section, uh, which is, um, where we found our big field, you can see there's nothing on the nears, but there's this super nice trough amplitude on the fars. So, well that's exactly what happened to us on the North Slope. We did not see what we were going through when we drilled through it. We didn't. I would love to be able to tell you that we knew what the fuck we were doing. 
we were going up, we were going down dip to a show that was trapped by Arco and it was a, an invisible section on seismic. Yeah. But you know what, once we drilled through it, then we went back and we looked at the seismic and we reprocessed the seismic and we're like going, now that I know what we're looking for, we'll bag it. And so, we didn't know what we were looking for at the beginning, but we know what we're looking for now. And we're now into this thing, 34 wells into it, and we're 31 out of 34 on Wildcats. Let me ask you a question. Woo! What's that? Yeah. So we thicken it, it thins to the west. Yep. And then thickens to the east. Yep. Yeah, it's, it, it's a strat trap pinch out to the west. I'll, I'll show you a, 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 a quick size one. So here's an example of that. Now that we know what we're looking for, we'll bag it. So this is the far stack profile on Pekka Field. Notice, notice the far stacks here with this big bright trough. Before we had nothing. Now we have that. So now we can look at it and we're going to say, okay, that's full of sand. And sure enough, <clears throat> the guys that drilled this well here, these poor bastards here, they drilled the top cat well here. They drilled down, they were chasing the Jurassic, they actually bottomed, they literally bottomed underneath our field. And they were just out in front of it. And they were there 10 years before me. Sam Gary Sr., which is one of the greatest wildcatters I've ever met, the guy who discovered Bell Creek Field, told me once, he said, Bill, the difference between a genius and a fool is 40 acres. <laughs> <clears throat> and in that case, it was, because they literally, if they had been literally a quarter mile to the west, they would have found it before me. So, no, I'm not sure they would have recognized it, but they would have found it before me. So, um, how's that for, like, nuts? So, uh, this... Where, where's the sediment coming from? From the west. The so, uh, no, the sediment is coming out of Russia. So, oh, it's coming... Russia. Yeah. Not the Brooks Range. No, no Brooks Range uh, deposition here. We have some of that later in a different prospect, but here, it's all coming out of Russia. So, it's prograding... Continental drift? Uh, no, I'm just going to say just sea level rise and fall with uh, prograding clinoforms from west to east. This is the largest clinoform system in the planet. Here. I mean, it's just, it's a simple system. But it's coming out of Russia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Siberia. So, they didn't call it Russia back in those days. This was about 50 million years ago. So, uh, <laughs> it's, actually, it's, it's, it's actually 50 million years ago next February. <laughs> What? Recognize yeah, we recognize the fact that these cliniforms are coming out of the West. Okay. Because it's just, we can see it, and I'll show you some lines in it a little bit, and you'll see it. It's just like a stair step. Okay. And um, by the way, have some more wine, guys. If we don't have enough wine, there's more in the back. By the way, this in Ingenuity, 2014 Ingenuity, which I made for y'all specifically tonight, this got a 98 point, a 98 point score on, uh, by the critics. So. By the way, two of my favorite wildcatters of all time uh, were the ones that got me interested in wine. It was Tom Jordan, who owns a winery called Jordan, creatively speaking, and uh, Ray Duncan, who owns Silver Oak. So, uh, two great wildcatters. Anyway, I see a hand raised. No, I did. Okay. Um, so, after we just drilled that last well, that Q8 well, which we were able to predict it, and said, you know, there's my there's my anomaly, there's my there's my Jonesy uh, noise. I can see this coming. Um, we started getting really cocky. So uh, my guys came to me and they said, boss man, we see this thing going a long way south. And so I decided like, you know, why not? Here's a seismic line through way down to the south. And you can see on the nears, this seismic line I'm gonna show you is like, way down here, 21 miles from our discovery up here to the north. So uh, here it is on the nears. There's not, a, there's nothing on the, on the nears, but look on the far, you can see all that trough. So we stepped out 21 miles and drilled that well and it came in. And I have never heard of a larger step out to a discovery in my career with the lone exception of the Kashigan field in the Kashigan Basin, which I think was a 22 mile step out. 
And uh, so I'm really damn proud of this will. And um, it was really funny because uh, we drilled it, and you can see on this map here, there's your isopack, and there's your oil gradient pressure curve on the right. And it was obvious as hell this was all in the same exact trap. It's very similar to, to uh, East Texas, you know, where you drill, you know, Daisy Braff for number three, and then you drill the Lou Delacram, and then you drill Web North. And we knew right away this is all one gigantic trap. And, uh, How much acreage did you control between the two? Fucking all of it. With the exception of uh, 10,000 acres that was stolen by Conical Phillips. That's a whole other story. But <laughs> so we had it all. So it's really, really terrific. I mean, occasionally good guys win. I'm putting myself in the good guy category on that one. So, uh, yeah, so, is this a great country or what? <laughs> this bad boy is 40 miles long, 10 miles wide, um, and it's 13 billion barrels of oil in place. We're only giving a recovery factor of about 30%, but it's probably gonna be even closer to 50 or 60. I mean, East Texas was 75% recovery factor. You know, they drilled on four acre spacing. We're not gonna do that, but. <laughs> So, um, <coughs> I'm not gonna walk you through that because that's uh, really technical and that's technical and that's technical and I'm gonna walk you through that. Okay, uh, here's your clinoform system. Um, down here on the left is uh, the north slope from basically the Chuck Chi Sea, you know, rushes this off the map here, all the way to Anwar to the east. Our discoveries are right here in the middle. And look and at all this. All this, this involves continental drift, correct? Uh, probably. Oh, probably. Uh, uh, you know what? I don't really know how the con continents were drifting back. You know, at this time, to be 100% frank with you, this is a basin filling system as you go from west to east. But the reservoir for Prudhoe Bay came from uh, Russia. Prudhoe Bay, I'm not positive. That was the Ivashak, so I'm not 100% uh, sure about the Ellesmerian section in Prudhoe. But what we're chasing, those sediments came from um, uh, Siberia. Siberia? Yeah, Siberia. Range. Yeah, not the Brooks Range. Which is, there may be some influence from the Brooks Range, but minor. But you can see uh, Clinoform, 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 just marching across the North Slope. And where we have found this these fields is right in here, and uh, it is, continues all the way over to Anwar, all the way to the east. Absolutely brilliant, and um, it hasn't been hardly looked at. So let me show you this quick map. Here's our, our big field here, Pika. Uh, it's a little over three and a half billion barrels. You all have all read about Willow. That's all in the news nowadays. Conoco has been fighting with the federal government to get approvals to drill this uh, guy. Uh, Willow was actually penetrated um, back in 2003 by Conoco. They didn't recognize what they had um, until we drilled Pika here. And then they used the data off of Pika to go delineate Willow. So Willow's an 800 million barrel field, and it's out here in the, in the uh, NPRA. So, um, after that, we've uh, since found this field called Stirrup. This is a 700 million barrel field here, and we found this field here called Midcuck to the east. All strat traps, all uh, essentially uh, middle Cretaceous, just beautiful sands, and um, we're, like I said, we're 31 out of 34. Here are all, all the shelf margins um, coming out of Siberia from west to east. There's like 95 of them. And there's our pick of field, there's Willow, there's Midcuck, and there's Stirrup. So right now we're, we've discovered almost 6 billion barrels, of which the average field size is 1.4 billion barrels. I have a technical question. Yes, <laughs> give me a technical. Both. So we're looking at top seals in the sense that the top seal shales will trap it from a vertical sense. And we have done all kind of top seal analysis and you don't need much. We can, we can uh, hold 700 foot of column back with like 15 foot of top seal. It's absolutely unbelievable. But as you go laterally, it's a sand going to a siltstone shale. So east to west, from east to west, it goes from sh sand to shale. 
from above. It's just a thin shell uh, catwalk on it. Shocking, shocking that that thin of a shell can hold back that much of a column. It's amazing. And I would say that all the experts prior to drilling would say that wouldn't happen. But it's really interesting if you look at Pika, Willow, Mint, Cuck, and Stirrup. And this is something that y'all should be thinking about because I don't know the answer to this. They all have almost exactly the same amount of column. They're all around 750 to 900 feet of column. Is that for the salt domes? No salt domes out here. There's no, I understand that. There's no salt in the system out here. This is just sands and shales. So. By the way, you're you're the awesome straight girl, uh, straight man. To, to, to what I'm what I'm what I'm, le uh, what I'm uh, leading into because you identified the number one thing to be afraid of out here. There are so many climate forms. Where do you where do you decide to drill? Because you go to the west or the east of you and you see wet and wet, and but you go here in the middle and you see this pay. You're kind of going, okay, well that climate form worked. But why would these other ones work or not work, right? I mean, the typical strat trap, the up dip seal is the toughy. That's the problem with strat traps. They're leaky. Everybody will tell you, you know, that's why I love a four way. Um, I, I would love a four way if I was born in. <laughs> You're 100% right. Um, what, the, what Joe Biden did with his executive action in trimming all this acreage out of the NPRA was theft of the American taxpayers. I mean, the taxpayers. What's that? Uh, well, I'm really hoping for that because I got a million acres going west, and so uh, you know. What's the average pressure gradient in those drills? High stack. So. What is it? 0.45. Yeah, a little bit higher, maybe 0.47. Depending on where you were in the column, uh, you know, so they're not overpressured, not geopressured. I mean, it's one of the problems actually for us in a way is it's it's so shallow and it's such a low GOR that we have to uh, start with pressure maintenance literally from day one. So every well we produce, we have to put in an injector. That's why the seal works. Um, first of all, talking about artificial intelligence. Um, there's not enough penetrations to do a, uh, an AI analysis of this. There's almost no penetrations of this as you go west. That's the beauty of this thing. This is wide fucking open, which is hard to believe. 16. 16? I told you the F-bombs are coming tonight. I mean, when you guys would have said four, I'm like, well, you're like way under. Yeah. I've been counting. <laughs> okay, there was another uh, hand up in the back. Okay. All right, so let's keep going. So let's go east because I'm going to show you something that is super confidential and I'm going to go really fast because I don't want you guys to, to know much about this. Um, we have 400,000 acres, and, and Jason, you can like to take a picture of this because, no, don't take a picture, but I've talked to you about this a lot. Um, as you go east here, there's literally almost no well control whatsoever and there's a well per 10 townships. I got a, uh, almost a 400,000 acre leasehold because I've added more since this uh, map is made. And every well out here was drilled chasing another Prudhoe. They were all drilled back in the late 70s, early 70s. And they were just chasing, you know, hoping to find a Prudhoe, and boom, 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 all these wells. And you had this gigantic airway that's right in the dead center of the maturation fairway of the huge shale. Every well has shows, some of them have bypass pay, and um, as we speak, I am mobilizing three rigs to go drill three wildcats out here. There's my ice road being built. That's what it looks like. When people tell you about the, the North Slope being beautiful, that's beautiful. <laughs> so we think we'll be on production by about 20 months from now. Uh, first phase will be about 80,000 to 100,000 barrels a day. And then um, with the development of PICA, 
from talking to my partner, uh, Santos, who's the operator, uh, they think it's going to go to about 320,000 barrels a day off of just pickup. Uh, Willow is going to be 180,000 barrels a day. Uh, that's the Conoco development going west. So uh, that's 500 million, 500,000 barrels a day off of those developments. Yeah. Uh, can somebody look up the score of the, uh, the uh, Michigan game? Score. 17-10. 17-10 Michigan. 17-10 Michigan. What's the, what quarter are we in? Third. Third quarter. Okay. I cannot believe HES actually had an event the night of the college football playoffs uh, when they're playing in, in freaking Houston, for God's sake. Hey, Bill, it's 20. 2010 now, Michigan, just got to feel good. Okay. okay. No, you can't believe that so many people are in here. Yeah. <laughs> Would you rather watch Michigan and Washington or listen to me talking bullshit about that? Uh, yeah, SMU lost their game. Hey. I was there, dude. Uh, I was on the field. There's one. Uh, brief question. Relatively low resistivity for such a long column. Uh, what are your what's your petrology? You got clay codes or? Uh, yeah, we have we have we have a lot of clay, a lot of lithics. So uh, over two ohms, three ohms is looks like low quality pay, and then if you have over ten ohms, if you're ever over twenty ohms, you're like in, in, in tall cotton. But the majority of your pay is is due to clays and petrography, just shaley sands. Thank you. And. Uh, this gets hammered at depth. So you, you give it, uh, you, you bury this and you put a little heat against it, your perm goes away quick. So uh, you need to make sure that when you're chasing this play, you're not chasing it where it's been. Um, no, excuse me, you don't chase it where it is now, you chase where it has been. And if it's been buried deep enough, you're not gonna have any perm. Now, what, what nobody has tried yet is what EOG does so well, or or Devon, or Oxy, or all these guys. Nobody has come up here and said, I'm gonna put in a, like a, a legitimate effort of fracking and drilling horizontal on, on this play because there's so much to do up here that is still, like you know, it's, it's in the first inning of what you see in the, in the shale place. Yeah, I got a question. That was one question, you said you had three questions. Did you have, oh, one, okay. I thought you said you had three. So in geoscientists, you've had an opportunity to hire geoscientists, work with geoscientists. What qualities do you look for in geoscientists? Oh, good question. SMU graduates. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely SMU graduates. All right, now we know where the SMU grads are. <laughs> um, Linda, that is such a great question. You've got, um, you've got some good folks on staff. Tell us about that. Uh, okay, so. All humbleness aside, um, I think I'm really good at some things. Um, I think I think in 3D better than most people. I think I can imagine the vicissitudes of the oil business better than most people. But I think what I'm best at is I really recognize talent. And true talent, especially wildcatting talent, is rare. And so, um, Charles, when I, it's really interesting, I would, I'd be, you know, back in the day when I was first starting out, I had no money, I had nothing, I had, I had nothing. And I would go and I would pitch a deal, I was like, I would, I would, anybody that would sit down and listen to me, I would show them a deal. And I would sit there and I'd be showing a deal to, let's say, 10 people at Chevron. And I'd be pitching it to them and everything, and I'd walk away from me and I'd say, there's one person in that room that got what I was saying. And I would make sure I, I kept their card because I'm like going, this young man or this young woman gets it. And it's such an intangible, because if you know my guys, you do, Charles, you would know that I don't hire for looks or personality. <laughs> I mean, this is like the roughest group of dudes. I mean, one of them we call Shrek because he was just like this ogre. But Shrek could find oil. And so, uh, 
And I didn't give a fuck how he looked or uh, uh, of his personality. I just knew he was really good at what he did. And so, um, so I think what I look for most of all is somebody who's uh, number one not willing to say something stupid. Linda, where is he? I lost her. Oh, there you go. Um, you have to fight for your right to party in our company. It's called uh, it's called uh, running the gauntlet. So all of our guys are so incredibly competent and technically avert. So we, when we come in, in order to get buyout by me on a project, you have to run the gauntlet. And that is you have to run your idea past every one of these guys who thinks they're the smartest guy in the room. And it's brutal. It is, it is a, it, running the gauntlet is the hardest thing that I would say that any of my employees go through. I've lost 50% of my hires because they couldn't handle the gauntlet. And because we're putting our own money in this deal. You know, when you're, you asked me earlier, you know, last year, I got $80 million I put in this deal. You know, I'm convincing somebody else to put their money into it. I'm gonna put, show them that I'm putting my money in first. And unlike a lot of these guys that are big companies, this is my money. This isn't the corporation's money. This is not private equity money, this is my money. So, Jason, you know, you know how I personally get when I start negotiating with you. This is my fucking money. So, I mean, I'm not talking about it. You know, you've seen me. So, it's good and bad, I suppose. You know, I, mean, I suppose you love it, but I suppose you hate it too simultaneously. But uh, so, uh, running the gauntlet is the hardest thing that my my young, uh, not young anymore, my uh, G and G team has to go through. Um, fundamentally, I think the way you run a company is you reward success way more than you penalize failure. And I think all the big companies miss that because I think they want to penalize you for making a mistake. And in my company, you know what? We all make mistakes. But you know what? If, if you're right, you win. You win but big. remember one thing. There's no substitute for luck. There's no substitute for luck. But here's, by the way, you cannot win the lottery if you don't buy a fucking ticket. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you're gonna get hit by the train, you gotta get on the tracks. You know, I'm just saying. Not New York. Not New York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hang on. You're so involved in this one project, which is fantastic, and it, it, it's probably, my guess, it's all consuming for you and your effort. But do you have a little? Secondary or another team somewhere looking for the next one that nobody's thought of? Yep. Okay. You're, where and is it? He speaks Italian. He's sitting at the table right in front of you. <laughs> so we're, uh, we're actually looking uh, all over the world all the time. By the way, uh, I'd love to hear what y'all think are the best plays in the world. I know the best onshore play in the world. It's right here. Um, I think. Right now, I would never, ever have ever guessed what's happening in Namibia. The fact that they're drilling in an abyssal plane and finding oil and whatnot is just, to me, yeah. talk about a paradigm shift. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who would have ever guessed Kuyana the way it is? Yeah. The way it is? Hold up, we've got mm -hmm. one more question. We've got, we've got John Cassiano. Just to go back to back in the days when you first started, being a 25 year old, going out there, I mean, the, the confidence you might have had, did you share that or was it completely just naive, you know, you're naive to the industry or can you talk more about that? How many doors did you knock on? How many ideas did you have like ready to go in folders? Um, how did you come up with the, being able to realize like how much you needed to finance these things and just sort of like somebody from start from scratch, what would you advise for them? Or maybe talk about your mentors at the time. All right, well, um, yeah. That's such a great question, and I, I could probably write a, I could probably give a seminar on this subject. Um, the, um, when I went on my own, I had no ideas. Uh, I had no uh, play concepts. I had no uh, family money. I had no private equity. The private equity wasn't even invented yet in 1985. Um, I think it was David Miller who went in with NCAP that really started the whole, um, and that was probably five, ten years later, maybe. Uh, banks would not give me any, any rope to hang myself. Um, but um, I, I, uh, 
I am John, I, so John, John, I am so tough on a deal. I am the toughest guy. Anybody who's ever tried to sell me a deal would realize I am really tough. I mean, Charles has tried to sell me deals. I'm a, I'm a dick when it comes to a deal. I mean, you've got to be, I mean, I'm, I'm so tough on a deal. And I've realized that if I'm not tough on a deal, if I can't convince myself, if I can convince myself, I can convince somebody else to put, to put money with me. So uh, that's why I was willing to like invest my net worth a number of times because I feel like if I can convince myself to do this deal, I know I can convince somebody else to join in with me on, on, on doing that. So um, the idea of going um, and pursuing on your own is, is really not for the faint of heart, but it's for the right person, it's, it's the only way to go. Uh, I, was, I, was an un, I was a terrible employee because I thought my, my bosses were stupid as fuck. Uh, you know, so I was really, really tough on my bosses. And my, one of my bosses early on was my dad. So it, for me to say that, it's really, it's brutal, actually. But um, what else did you ask for? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the wine started kicking. You, know, you, know, you, you already kind of answered that you didn't really have an idea of prospects or plans mm -hmm. in your mind when you started. So that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. sort of unique. I think most people would step into this field or realm having some ideas, but yep. you're just willing to go for it and just figure I, it out as you go. It, it, because I, I don't even know what's going to be coming down the pike in six months. For, for me now, and I've been doing this for 40 years, and I love it. I love every day I wake up in this business. I'm I'm so incredibly blessed to be in this business. I mean, what a great business. Were you, were you looking for buried treasure? I mean, seriously, how much fun is that? You know, I mean, it's really, really terrific. And when you find something, despite all the nonsense you hear about bad hydrocarbons and global warming and all this horse shit you hear about, this is making the world such a better place. So you know you're finding something that is truly world-shatteringly good for the greater good. And so uh, it is a, it is a, it's a calling. And I feel that way when I'm doing it. And, I, I'm not, and I'm unbelievably blessed that I can be in a business that I love it so much that I'm sitting there. I am the weird guy that at 2 in the morning I wake up and I can't sleep. And I go to like Geo Petro online and look at like history of old fields. Most guys go to porn, I go to that. So, you know, I'm just, I'm just that weird guy. You know, they're just like, and I, I, I read the stories, I you know, read the stories about East Texas, I read the stories about the discovery of uh, Pickett, you, you know, Berganfield, and you know, in Kuwait, whatever, just, you know. But you know what? I'm, I'm just saying, <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm hey, by the way, by the way. I'm But by the way, Deb, you're 100 percent right. Uh, the do not go Democratic. All right, I'm not going to go. I'm, I'm not going to go political. But I will say this. No, you need uh, to. We've got to. Because well, we're being assaulted. We, we are being. You know, we are being assaulted. You're right. Uh, you got to. We've got to stand up. Everyone's speech is required here. All right. I, I, uh, but by the way, I, I can. Uh, I, I can, Federico can attest to this because I've talked to him about this a lot. I have never, I've, I've looked, I've kicked tires all over the world. I've been, I've eaten sheep eyes out of a yurt in Kazakhstan. I've been in Tumen, Siberia, when, just after the wall came down. I've been, I've been in Turkey right by, I've been in Australia, I've been all over the world. And I have never, pulled the trigger on an international deal because at the end of the day I always said I'm going to get nationalized. Mm -hmm. yep. And I just got fucking nationalized by my own country yep. in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Who would ever have thought that would happen in our country? But it has. It's very, very scary what has happened uh, to us. So I completely concur with your, your comment because we are doing what is best for the world and the idea that we are being vilified and put into some kind of box for being a bad, peop bad people is just really, really, really uh, disturbing. And they're all missing the big picture. They want to depopulate the world, I think. That's, that's the goal. 
Here's the fastest way to depopulate the world, is to make the world flourish. Because the only places that are not replacing their population are the places that are flourishing. And so you want to really reduce population, if that's your goal, then bring capitalism to the world. That's just, that's just a simple fact. And the idea, the idea that our country, with Western Europe and the United States, Canada and Japan, is a billion people. Why are we dictating to the other seven billion have-nots what they should and should not fucking do with their uh, raising their country out of poverty? It's a problem. It's arrogant and it's embarrassing that our country is doing that. Yeah, that's twenty. That's twenty. Twenty, okay. <laughs> the over. Uh, you should have taken the over on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The big idea technically tonight, uh, I thought, was the uh, the ABO for oil. Yeah. And so. Um, two questions. Uh, can you explain that from a physics standpoint? Yeah, so. Uh, and then, then B, okay. is there a minimum thickness of oil that you need to, to have in order to show that? Okay, two fantastic questions. Um, first of all, we're um, the holy grail of the AVO searching for oil is really, it's almost unheard of. The only place I've heard of it in the United States, in the world right now, is in Guyana. And if you talk to um, Hess, which is now Chevron, and you talk to, to Exxon, their unbelievable run of success in Guyana, which I think I was, I was talking to the CEO of Exxon recently, and I said, who's, who's ever gone 21 for 25 in a play? I mean, I mean just really, in a big, big stuff. And he will tell you that they, they see the DHI of direct detection of oil. So, so in Alaska, uh, I'm, we're lucky in a sense that um, the source rocks are not over mature. So like in the Gulf of Mexico, you have a lot of you have a lot of gas risk. In Alaska, right now we don't. So kind of by default, uh, we don't have that just raging you know kind of gas uh, AVO anomaly. Yeah. So. Um, and thickness-wise, we're looking at probably a 75-foot minimum. Yeah. It, it, so it, you know we can't we can't go too much less than that. Um, and um, I think they're going to write papers about this in Alaska, you know, in, in, in 20 years from now, and say, oh my God, that was like the Halcyon days. So it must be an, an acoustical event or an acoustical property, since we're dealing with acoustical energy. Yeah. So I didn't walk you through the BPVS ratio versus impedance, um, but uh, this really breaks out of the BPVS impedance ratio uh, when you um, when you see oil. So you can do a fluid substitution model, and you can see it going from uh, water to oil to gas, and we just it just sits in that perfect oil window. Uh, there are, there is a little bit of gas up here, but it's not, nothing like in the Gulf of Mexico. You don't have to worry about. So, Is anybody got a question? Brad Juno, you found 60 fields in the Gulf of Mexico. Do you have any questions for me, young man? I've heard it all. <laughs> <laughs> so my question Brad Juno is one of the greatest oil finders I've ever met in my entire life, and he looks like he's an unmade bed. <laughs> <laughs> so are you the last wild counter? No, no, no. <laughs> I just happen to be the one who's willing to talk about it. I mean, there's, I, I, I actually think that people look at me as a hologram. You know, they're afraid that if they touch me, I mean, there's a hand will go right through me. Uh, but uh, I, know, I know that uh, the Wall Street Journal wrote me up as the last wildcatter and some other things, but the problem is, it's, it, for the young, John, for the young, uh, it, it, it is su it's such a non-attractive place to be, which is sad for me because we use 101 million barrels a day of oil and probably 300 BCF a day of gas. How is the world going to keep feeding itself? If I, if I may, I think it's just the, the false premise that the media and governments and politicians are pushing on everything. But do you think about the future of this country? about exploration and conventional exploration? All right, that's a really good question. I, so I had a really interesting dinner a couple of months ago, and I had 
I'm not going to name drop here, but I will. Uh, and Travis Stice, head of Diamondback. Harold Hamm was at dinner. John Chrisman, head of Apache. Um, and probably seven other CEOs of big companies. And they told me about going to a seminar. And they said, who in this room has ever drilled a dry hole? And nobody's hand went up. <laughs> Which tells you that all they know now is this unconventional world. And I can tell you that most of those wells never made any money, but they always found oil and gas. So, um, Victor, it's been a big, it's a big, it's a, it's been a brain drain, and we're precariously losing a lot of the talent that was in this. Because when I call people up now and I say, hey, I want to show you a deal that's going to be a wildcat, and it's like, I might as well be speaking Greek. You know, I mean, because they don't even know, like, what, 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 what? You know, and I'm like, no, I can show you something that will really make you money. Granted, it has risk, but it's going to be, it's going to, one, it's going to move your needle. It's going to double the size of your company. And uh, so it's a real concern. I don't know the answer to that. Because I'm only now, I mean, if you notice, uh, you know, for sure, I mean, who have I done deals with over the last 15 years? You know, it's been E&I, it's been Repsol, it's been Oil Search, it's been Santos, it's been non-U.S. Because non-U.S. got into the world where it's like, I'm doing just unconventional. I, I, I can understand the desire to drill unconventional, where you say, it, most companies are run by engineers, let's face it, they, they say, you know what, there's eight million dollars a well, I will never, never drill a dry hole, and show me a play where I can drill a thousand wells. I can spend eight billion in capital, and I can dictate my future, and I take away all my volatility. I get it, I get the, the allure of that. Um, what they don't talk about is how much money they lost in the process, but um, anyway, uh, I don't know the answer to that. It's scary. It's probably worse in Europe. We can go on all that. You want to kill a couple of billion people? Eliminate hydrocarbons. I mean, it's absolutely. If you want to, if you want to ruin the world, if you want to force us back into caves, eliminate hydrocarbons. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you to Linda. Yeah. And to Charles for organizing all this. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Charles. Okay, I want to go deep technical. When I look, when you, when you talk about your, your different reservoirs, they all have 750 feet, right? Yep. On column. And to me, that tells me that, okay, your seal is filled to the spill, to, yep. to the capillary breakthrough. Are you guys looking, trying to find areas where you have slightly thicker seal and hoping for thicker columns, or is that part of your exploitation strategy? Or are you just looking not off, off, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, is this is this too 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 proprietary? Uh, no, it's not proprietary at all, and it's exactly what I've asked my G and G team to to look into, and um, uh, we don't have a conclusion to that. But yes, the answer to the, uh, that question is, if seven fifty is is fifteen feet can hold back seven fifty, what can fifty feet hold back? I mean, it's a perfectly logical question to ask, and I ask it all the time. It's a Middle East. Cool, and I, I actually I. I don't think that we're as good as we think we are, frankly. When you say you're 31 out of 34 uh, on Wildcats, which is what we've been since we you know, found this technique, it's a little bit like a really, really good basketball player saying they're shooting 80% from the field. You're clearly not taking enough shots. And you're not, you're, you're, all you're doing is layups. So I don't know, I, I think the geology is telling us something that we're not recognizing. And we're taking credit for being better than we think we are. I think. I mean, I'm humble. I've, I've been humbled enough in my career to know that like nobody goes 31 out of 34 on Wildcat Wells. I mean, it's just it, it doesn't happen unless something is happening that we don't yet understand. And this may be an area that you know what you just you find the right client for the right position you're going to drive. Yeah. So what a night. Uh, first of all, thank you. Bill. Yeah. That's fun. By the way, this this picture was taken by my wife of a porcupine caribou and her uh, its calf underneath the pipeline. 
nursing. So anybody worries about like, what's that? It's warmer. It's warmer under the pipe. So when we were putting this together, we were thinking maybe we should title it Bill Unleashed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you've held back too much, have you? I don't think so. I don't think so. I got a 20 on the, on the, <laughs> on the F-bomb score. So, 21. 21. No, 15. So, 15. What, a night, what a great start to the year. Um, that's what these programs were meant to do, is get everybody fired up in early January. We've got a new year. Happy New Year, everybody. We have a gift for everybody. As you go, don't forget, we have a 100th anniversary special issues. Craig Dingler um, has uh, put brought the uh, mural of 100 HDS past presidents because this is still the continuation of the HDS 100th anniversary. Paul, no, you're the captain, and we're grateful to you. And series of professional programs, geoscience, public outreach, it's just amazing. If you want to really appreciate what HDS does, grab one of these. They're, they're a gift for you on the way out. We have a bag, too, from GeoGull. You can take the bag. Linda made the 100th anniversary pins. So you, if you don't, you don't have one of them, grab one of the HDS 100th anniversary <laughs> pins. And so, Bill, I, I was going to give you this, uh, the, but you've already got it. The T. Boone Pickens, the first billion. Oh, yeah, that's a good book. You've already got it. I listened to our audio books about a month ago. Mm -hmm. It's great. So, but you don't have this one. No, I don't. I'm looking forward to this. One. This one, this guy, this is Max Steinecke. Oh. He knew a little bit about oil and gas, and he's sitting on on a small field. I'm sure he'd be envious of what you're doing, <laughs> but he's sitting there in Gawar. Anyway, there's some great stories in here, and we oh, have man. a copy he, for you. He's in Gawar, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. that was a good. It's in there in East Texas. Find more oil than Max. Yeah, <laughs> and you might. And a copy for Carter Timble. Okay, fantastic. Thank Carter you. Timble's Thank one you. of the super duper guys that work for Bill. Thank you. Charles, it's great. Thank you for doing this. Yeah. 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 What a hug, buddy. Okay.